So welcome everyone. Well, welcome back. Happy New Year. Uh, we left off uh, with the chapter on three base methods. Uh, and for this following chapter, in a sense, we also uh, have a similar uh, kind of toolbox in, in the sense that for three base methods, we focused on an elemental mathematical object uh, in order to perform, uh, well, not only regression, but also classification. Uh, and that was just um, the rectangle, uh, classification via rectangles, or, well, also generalized rectangles, so something like cubes, hypercubes, and such. So in that same fashion of working with uh, fundamental geometric objects, in this chapter, now we focus on well, what they are called hyperplanes in order to perform a classification. So this is poorly classification, not a numeric regression. Uh, but at least for the for the most part, in this chapter, we cover only binary classification. There is a small mention of how we can deal with the case of multiple categories. Uh, but really, it's not um, something more complex that doing some uh, n number of pairwise classifications. So for the most part, it's just the binary, binary case. Uh, so let's see, ah, I'm using the note for of the R cohort because I mean, it's the same theoretic, theoretical content. So first we will, we will define what a maximal margin classifier is, then a looser version of it, that is a support vector classifier, and then a tool that allows us to generalize a disclassification approach a, for perhaps, well, what they are called nonlinear kernels, but these are what are actually labeled as super vector machines. And yeah, we can begin. So this is a fundamental object that I was talking about, the hyperplane. A, as you can tell from this label hyper, it's just a generalized version, I mean, dimension-wise, of some object that we are already familiar to. For example, in R2, that is in two dimensions, the hyperplane would be one dimension lower. So what is one dimensional in, well, in the Euclidean space, that is simply a line. As we can see over here, we have some data set. The different color represents a different class. Um, for this special case, uh, we see that uh, a, a line is sufficient to classify, sorry, to classify this this category. Now, for uh, for the case of three dimensions, the hyperplane would be also one dimension lower of the total space. So, in this case, it would be a plane. And as we can see over here, it is also sufficient for this particular uh, very big example is sufficient to classify these to classify these observations into these two categories. Uh, and so for well that is the geometric sense of what a hyperplane is. Um also the algebraic way of or the mathematic no yeah algebraic way of dealing with it is also uh, quite simple a simple generalization of the uh, line formula. As we can see if we have a pi P minus one dimensional hyperplane when coming from a P dimensional space, usually a plane one. Uh, then the formula that describes this hyperplane is as follows. We have some real numbers, uh, beta sub zero, beta sub one, and such. And then the, the coordinates of the space. That is just a case of the three dimensional case and a two-dimensional hyperplane. Now, that is a description of the mathematical object, but what, what we want to do with such object is to find, well, if it exists, at least to look for one, and that allows us to split the whole space into into the two classifications of our data. For example, for this particular data, how would, we, how would we know which would be the ideal hyperplane that splits the data 
Uh, as even, as even, almost as evenly as possible into separate classes. We have these three candidates, uh, and of course we need a quantity, quantitative way of determining which is better. Um, at least from a simple inspection, it does look that the hyperplane is the best that uh, it splits a data set into different categories. So, so the idea uh, to, to to measure uh, how well no sorry how uh, an observation is classified via the hyperplane uh, well we can use that via the following representation so we have our formula for a particular hyperplane in this case of dimension I think it's p or p minus one uh, yeah p, p minus one um and for the categories will we label them them as one and the other category as minus one. So uh, an important property that this hyperplane has is that it, uh, of, of the, sorry, of this particular one over here, we are separating one, is that it, for the cases where the category has a value of one, this particular formula is positive. And for the other case, where this observation has been labeled as minus one, then the same formula uh, now outputs a negative number. So it, it is sufficient via the sign of this formula uh, to know uh, which category to assign to, to a particular observation, right, to this observation over here. Uh, well, and that's what they mentioned over here. You simply look at the a design, uh, but also we, we not uh, we do not only have a sense of uh, to which category to classify, but also a sense of uh, how trustworthy is that classification. And um, and a simple idea is to to take into account not only this sign over here of this, but also now given this separating hyperplane. Well, what is the distance of uh, an observation to that particular hyperplane. For example, for this point over here, it is quite close to the hyperplane, so we may assume that maybe for this particular observation, uh, we have uh, a low confidence uh, of this particular classification. In this case, classification as, as blue. Uh, whereas for this case, this observation pretty far away from the hyperplane, we would have um, a greater no, yeah, greater confidence in the that this that this observation has been classified correctly because the distance to a hyperplane is greater. Uh, and that is what is being measured by well, this is also uh, this expression by this. This is actually uh, proportional to the distance to this observation x i one up, up to x y p. Uh, its distance to the hyperplane considered. The greater this value is, uh, well, no, how, how was it? The greater it was in, in module, so ignoring the, the sign, only considering positive, then the higher the confidence for the classification, uh, and, this, and the closer this value is to zero, so something like this, or this then the lower our confidence is uh, for this particular uh, classification. Uh, so in that sense, uh, we know that distance to a hyperplane uh, gives us a... Uh, there, oh, hi, Ricardo. Hi, how are you? Happy New Year. <laughs> Happy New Year. Happy New Year. <laughs> Okay, so now we were talking about this case of the maximal margin classifier, because we saw uh, how the distance from observation to a hyperplane gave us a sense <coughs> uh, of the confidence in the classification for the observation. So what we want to look at, to look, sorry, what we want to get from this data is uh, which is, well, if it exists, actually it does exist, which is the, 
the hyperplane that it is the farthest away from this training data set. Well, for this data set. And if we we would assume that such hyperplane, that is the one that is the farthest away, uh, that would be the ideal one for, for us to make the classification. Uh, and that idea of working with the farthest away hyperplane to a data uh, is what is considered over here for this maximal margin classifier. Uh, because what they are focusing on uh, in this optimization problem, I think it's in the next part. It's over here. Maximize these distances of the points to the hyperplane, uh, subject to all unique representations of the hyperplane. Uh, this is just like uh, the norm of the yeah, the norm of the vector of the unitary vector that uh, univocally represents the hyperplane. Uh, and that is, as, as I mentioned, that's a sense, or they also mentioned over here, uh, this condition over here, it says it ensures that each observation will be correctly classified as long as M is positive. Uh, and M is going to be these distances for, for, for observations to the data set. So, well, yeah, it's going to be positive. We want the farthest sorry. away. Ah, sorry, there was a comment. So the idea is that like the line isn't too close to either point that like for each of the categories, the line isn't too close to either point. It's kind of like equally far from like the points that are like where we want to break, like classify them as two separate groups. Yeah. That's what, that, yeah. Yeah, it then says, wait, what, what you mentioned, this is a particular case where it does happen. So these, three points, they are equally far apart from the hyperplane. Uh, it, it turns out also that in order to, to define this particular of separating hyperplane, uh, the other points were not really relevant to that, but these three, these three ones were the, the ones that define it. So we can already see that there is some high sensitivity uh, of which hyperplane do we use given the data? Because in this case, okay, these three define the hyperplane, but so what is what if one of these is not considered? Then does a the hyperplane change too much or too little? Um, well, I don't know if they mentioned it over here in the next page, but it does it does change. So this particular approach of using the farthest away hyperplane to the data set, uh, it is quite sensitive to outliers because it is defined by only a few points of the observations also. So uh, what, what, ah, sorry. So due to that, it also happens that uh, this technique of generating a hardware plane for classification, it usually tends to, uh, uh, how do you say? Uh, to, uh, Ah, overfitting tends to arise in, in for this case of the forest away hybrid thing. So in order to avoid uh, such overfitting, because for this optimization problem, uh, the hybrid plane is quite sensitive to a couple of points. As we saw, it can be to very few points, for example, over here for three. So the loosened version of this approach of maximal margin classifier or farthest away hyperplane to the data uh, is this one over here, what it is called support vector classifier. Uh, well, they also mentioned over here that the issue that we already comment about our fitting. So the loosening is going to happen in the sense that we're going to allow some observations to be incorrectly classified, uh, but at least that uh, that will deal with the with the problem of overfitting. So if we now go back, no, if we now look at the optimization problem to find in this loosened version of the farthest away hyperplane, uh, we see that the change 
is, for example, over here, this, uh, this product, these are considered uh, positive coefficients, uh, but however, they are also restrained to a particular number. In, in this case, this value C, as I mentioned, it's going to be a non-negative tuning parameter that we usually will estimate via cross-validation. It says it can be sought as the budget for margin violation via well, well, by the observations. So how loose uh, do we treat our model uh, compared to the maximal margin classifier case? For example, if C were to be zero, then because these epsilon values are non-negative, they would be zero, they could be one, and so we would we would go back to the exact optimization problem that we already covered in the maximal margin classifier classifier case. So this negative number is controlling that that looseness. Uh, an important observation over here. For example, it says that if C is positive, then no more than C observations can be on the ground side of the hyperplane. Okay, so that's how we control the looseness of the of the hyperplane that we're looking for. Um, for example, uh, now what is a change in the hyperplane found uh, via this uh, now modified optimization problem? Uh, let's see for this particular example, what does it say in the description? So a support vector classifier was fit. Uh, so we consider four different possible values of this tuning parameter C. Okay, over here C was the greatest. And then it goes down and down. And it mentions, when C is large, there is high tolerance for observations being on the ground side of the margin. And we can see that over here. For example, for this first graphic, there are like one, two, three, four, five observations in, in this area where we would assume for them to be all of the purple class. Now, uh, we lower a little bit this value C this tuning parameter. And now we have, for example, over here, only one observation that has been uh, incorrectly classified. And over here, on this other side, only two. So there's relaxation. Uh, and so and so, they are shrinking the parameter. And in a sense, uh, the hyperplane is converging uh, to that one that we would have uh, gotten. If we simply uh, look for the for the maximal margin classifier hyperplane, uh, and that is just the case as C tends to zero. And this is an important uh, aspect of this tuning parameter. It says C controls the bias variance trade-off of the classifier. A large C produces high variance but low variance and a small c, so something like the maximal variance classifier, will low bias, but high variance. Mm, okay. Uh, and now, because we, we've been working with hyperplanes, I mean, uh, these are some quite ideal uh, vector spaces. So there is quite a bit of linear, linearity uh, related to them. Uh, however, the classification may not work if we are limited to, the, to that linear scenario. So as we already saw, for example, for other classifiers, where we manipulated the data, something like this, where they multiply by higher order terms, terms of the numeric values in our data, uh, we can we can uh, consider other types of classification boundaries. In this case, we are working with nonlinear ones. 
and perhaps a, a simple approach uh, I've, I've already been doing in other classification models is simply to not pass the data directly to the model but uh, these higher order terms uh, that we get from 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 the data but by manipulate manipulating it in some way uh, well and as as you do that uh, well it can it can work yes as a type of nonlinear classification so maybe the model may work or not but however we still get the problem of if, how do we modify the data I mean, how, for example, why over here a uh, power of two, why not a power of three, and such and such. Uh, so because this problem is too open about how to modify the data in order to to relax the classification boundary to not make it li only linear, uh, instead of working with this approach, uh, what can be done is what it is described over here in the case of support vector machines. Uh, and what is solved is that uh, in general, the yeah, data, it cannot be split simply via a hybrid thing. However, if you embed this data into a higher order dimensional space, so for example, when we were working with only the plane, if we were to move, uh, let, let me show the picture maybe. It would be much clearer over here. In this case, where we're working with two data, if we were to lift up all of this region uh, colored in blue, maybe like but just by one unit into the theta axis, that is uh, the axis that is perpendicular to the screen, it's coming into us. Then in that case, it will be I mean, pretty trivial to know that a hyperplane parallel to this uh, x1, x2 rectangle, it will also be um a perfect classifier for for this scenario right here so we're going to, to be doing the same that is lifting our data into higher order higher order dimensional space and then in that space maybe it does exist a uh, some also higher order hyperplane that does indeed separate the data into into the appropriate classes uh, to which they belong so that is what we do over here. In the case of support vector machines, uh, and that and that transformation of the data to embed it into a higher order dimensional space, we do that by what is called a kernel function. Uh, for what we have been doing in, in these previous cases of the maximal margin classifier and the support vector classifiers. I think the kernel was exactly this one. I'm not sure. Uh, but now, because we are lifting the data to higher dimension, uh, other nonlinear kernels can be considered. And this is just an example of a polynomial one. Um, but in particular, <clears throat> Uh, the, the author does mention, for example, this type of kernel, the royal kernel. Um, well, this could be the, the formula used. Uh, there seems to be, I think there were a couple of, how do you call it? Uh, what was the name of the tuning parameters that we get via cross-validation? Ah, hyperparameters, I think. Uh, in this case, I think there was the purpose of lambda. You, you also don't need to, uh, as a hyperparameter, given this uh, ra radial kernel. And, and the idea, what this function is doing is, for example, this type of separation. As you can see, it, it's like uh, this part over here. Uh, how do you graph? You can imagine that over here, there is some big circle, and that as we consider now a bigger circle over here, this is the bigger circle. This region in between uh, uh, serves as a separator uh, for the classification that we want to do. So in that sense, it's, it's radial. So like many rings, uh, one bigger than the other. And let's see, there is a comment. 
uh, Ricardo mentions start quest support vector machines. Thank you, Ricardo. Okay. Uh, and just to, to, to end on this chapter, it's, it is a brief mention of the case of more than two classes because we have only been working in, working in the case of binary classification. Uh, and, but as I said, uh, well, the idea is uh, quite simple. For example, this case of one versus one approach. So we compare all the possible pairings of classes and see what would be the, the classification that we get. Uh, and yes, from from those count that we get for all of these pairs, we would assign to the most popular uh, assigned classification, no, assigned class. So like just compare one by one and then do a majority vote. Uh, and then another one is this one over here, one versus all. So in this case, you fill one of the classes and then compare it to the rest. So now this uh, K classes problem has turned into a binary one. And because it's binary, uh, well, it's, it's the same case that we have already covered. So we know what to do. Uh, and yes, the lab is pending. Uh, however, we, we do not do this because it's in Python. So we will be covering the exercises uh, next week. Are there any comments, questions? I do have a question, but after you, perhaps. Not to me. Okay. Did anyone get this part over here? Okay. In particular, about this, the feature space being infinite dimensional. The feature space is supposed to be uh, this higher order space where we embedded the data into, right? So uh, I don't know how it can be infinite dimensional. I thought it was only of higher order, well, higher dimension, but it's still finite. Uh, did anyone understand that part? I don't, but I'm wondering if it has to do with anything like the idea of the area under a curve or anything? I don't know. I have no idea, but I know like when we we're looking at the other picture, um, do you go back to the other um, picture? Like on the next one, I think. Um, Where? It's not. It was, because I think it was with the radio kernels and it was like, it was, um. The pretty colored one. <laughs> like it was, you saw the curve on like the three dimensional space. And do you mean a picture in the book? Um, I'm pretty sure it was on the slide. Uh, maybe a yeah. previous one or here? Yeah, 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 that one. Like I'm wondering if it has to do anything with the idea of like the area under a curve kind of thing. Like, there's like infinite possibilities of what like number they're taking. I don't know. I have no idea, but that was like kind of when I look like that, looked at that, it kind of reminded me of like, the idea of like a um normal distribution and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure as well. I mean, because even this particular area under this, well, under this volume, I think it's finite, right? Uh, like the interval of this expression. I mean, it has to be because it's, it's also, I mean, just a multiple of a, a, a density of some, how do you call it? Variable letter, yeah? uh, uh, Because it's a, it's a density of some multivariate normal. So it's, there is has to be, well, the volume has to be finite. So yeah, okay. I'm, not, I'm not sure. Uh, but I well, think Ricardo still... was going to say something. Can you repeat? 
No, I was just saying, I think Ricardo was saying something at one point. Yeah, Ricardo, do you have a comment? Yeah, I, I was looking for that, uh, for the infinite dimensional, and I found this link. Okay. Let's see. Yeah. If you can press it, yeah. It says that the RFBF kernel is a projection into infinite dimensions. Okay. And it starts doing the mathematical uh, proof about it. What I think is a particular uh, attribute to that to that kernel. Okay. <clears throat> over here, what is pi? This function over here. Uh, projection vector space. The function of projection vectors into a new vector space. Yeah. Okay, so this would be an. Uh, With R infinity, mm -hmm. that is, well, it depends. It depends also, now, now you have the question, what type of infinity? I think it's a, a left one because of this later part. And let's see. I don't know, they usually show it over here. Over here, yeah, because it tends to be a sum of the, over the natural, so. Mm -hmm. I would suppose that it is mapping from Rn, well, up to the space of real sequences. Well, that but that is also infinite dimensional. So, right. Uh, well, I don't get this like right now, but it, it does seem very interesting. So I will have to check it out later. So, thank you very much, Ricardo. Okay, and and another uh situation that you should be aware of the support vector machines. Uh, usually when we are, we are applying these algorithms in the real world, uh, the support vector machine, uh, because of the mathematical you know, uh, process involved, uh, it doesn't do well with large data sets, okay? You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's very cumbersome. So, uh, for small and medium data sets, it works, you know, pretty well. But for big data, uh, super vector machines, you know, it won't, uh, it, it won't cut it. You know, it, it, you you need a, a lot of resources, uh, you know, to to have it, to have an efficiency, uh, uh, you know, in terms of the hyperparameter tuning and also in production. So that's why usually you don't see it mentioned in the you know in the gallery of uh usual f uh, algorithms that you that you know that we have uh studied for example uh gradient boosting uh decision trees etc uh but for small and medium data sets let's say for you know 100,000 observation 200,000 even 2000 uh the this algorithm is pretty pretty good okay in terms of the of the accuracy you know, uh, and not overfitting. But for big data, uh, uh, it won't, you know, it, it will be too uh, uh, too cumbersome. That's interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah. About uh, being, so. Yeah, that, that's, uh, you know, the, the, I don't know if it's in the book, but I saw another a graph, you know, comparing oh, different right algorithms in terms of, you know, how many observations they can handle. And I mean, after 100,000, 200,000 observations, SVM just, you know, uh, you know, it keeps running. <laughs> it won't converge. <laughs> okay. Uh -huh. So, yeah. So that that's one thing that you have to be aware. That's why, for example, you know, usually for big data, it's not used. Uh, by the way, in the case of big data, uh, do these models that, well, they have the uh, sensitivity to our layers, uh, mm -hmm. Do they work like good enough for those cases? Uh, usually for big data, what you will have is uh, you know, XGBoost, LightGBM algorithms type type algorithms. 
uh, tree based, and also uh, deep learning. Okay. Uh, deep learning. Uh, deep, deep learning. And sometimes, you know, you can get good, you know, a, a, a good uh, approximation with, uh, you know, linear or even logistic regressions. Okay. Uh, but uh, the support vector machines, uh, it's too cumbersome, the the computation, you know, for, for big data. Usually, you know, you can you can use it for small and medium, not for large. I mean, you, you'll need a lot of uh, computer resources, uh, you know, to, to get, you know, to get something that is practical. <clears throat> Thank you, Ricardo. Yeah. Uh, well, I think we can close for now. So let me 